At my son's birthday party eight years ago, and I've just realized it was actually eight years ago this weekend, I heard one of his friends ask my dad a question. And the small boy kind of sauntered up to him and said, so, Stephen, what would happen to me if I fell in a black hole? And the little boy asked the right person because my father is an astrophysicist, and so he really likes talking about black holes at parties. <laughs> you would be ripped into spaghetti, my dad replied, and the children were delighted. They were like, spaghetti, of course, and they started spaghetti dancing around the kitchen. <laughs> and watching them, I could see they had no problem visualising this. Their imaginations were open to exploring the universe. And they had this kind of childlike wonder and joy and this natural affinity with the subject matter, which made them just like astrophysicists. Now, the adults in the room look confused. They were trying to put on their intelligent faces um, and pretending that they understood, but they didn't get it. And I could see they wanted to understand, and they were already kind of worrying about the inevitable follow-up question on the way home in the car, like, so, Mum and Dad, what is a black hole? Um, and so you could say, when I heard the boy ask the question, I had three revelations. The first was that the children were fascinated by the subject matter. Now, my father has long-term ALS, and so he speaks through a computer. So he has to activate an infrared beam by a twitch of a cheek muscle, and this infrared beam connects to the cursor on his computer screen, and so it, the rate of speech is quite slow. It's around three to five words a minute. But the kids didn't budge. While he was typing up the answer, they just stood there. They were fascinated. They really wanted to know. Now, the second revelation was that my father had not only the wit and the knowledge to give his young audience an answer, but he could give them an answer they related to. So, a black hole, of course, as we know, um, is a region of space where gravity is so dense that nothing, not even light, will escape. And if we were to go to the edge, to the event horizon, and fall in, we would be ripped into shreds. We would be turned into spaghetti, an everyday dish which all kids can picture. And the third revelation was that the question, what would happen to me if I fell in a black hole, was in fact a story. And I could see that this was the way to explain astrophysics to this age group. A child's frame of reference is very, very small, and it's centred on themselves. And they look for a story with the figure of a child to take them through an experience. And so this, it occurred to me, was what we needed to do. We needed to go to the edge, to the event horizon of the black hole. We needed to experience it. We needed to create an emotional connection with this cosmic phenomenon. And we needed to tell a story about it. And I realised that the adults would be keen to come along on the journey, that this was something parents and children could go on a great cosmic voyage together, and they would both learn, even if the parents were still pretending that they already knew. Now, I'm not claiming it's a new idea, because humans have always used storytelling to explain the wonders of the natural world around us. A few years ago, I was in Australia, and I heard about an Australian Aboriginal Dreamtime myth, 40,000 years old, in which two stars fall in love and they come down to Earth where they become the first humans. And you could see this as a kind of interesting take on modern nuclear physics, which teaches us that elements formed in the belly of a star sent out in great clouds of gas and dust when the star reaches the end of its life and dies, these elements are what we are made of. And so, like the humans in the Dreamtime myth who were stars that came to Earth, we're all made of stardust. There are Norse myths which explain thunder as the wrath of the gods. There are ancient Mayan legends around what is an eclipse. And from Aesop's fables, 
to Kipling's Just So Stories. We have always used a story to explain, give a reason, whether it's improbable or hilarious or based in truth or totally fanciful, as to why things are the way they are. And so surely I thought, right, after 40,000 years of storytelling, in the 21st century, there will already be an adventure story about a boy who fell in a black hole. So I went to look for one. I went to look to see if somebody was already using the excitement and the wonder and the reality of our universe to tell an adventure story, and there was nothing. And so I realised we had to write it for ourselves. Now, ideas are very time dependent, and it felt like when I came up with this concept, a lot of people were asking a different question. A lot of people were saying, why are children not interested in science anymore? And there were a rash of headlines around this time. Um, Mars, it's a candy bar, not a planet, say so US school children. Um, British school, school children said that Winston Churchill was the first man on the moon. Or uh, my favorite, Britney Spears, world's greatest living scientist. So why, given that the kids had the obvious fascination with the subject matter, why were they not latching on to science in school? Well, one reason seemed to be a lack of relatability. So if you ask a group of nine-year-old school children about gravity, one or two will perk up. But take the same group and explain that if we were on Mars and we jumped up in the air, Due to the lower gravity, we would be able to go two and a half times higher and stay up for two and a half times longer. And then we'd be able to move across the surface of Mars in great bouncing leaps and ask, what would it be like to play football on Mars? And the dynamic in the room changes completely. And so you could say, does it really matter? Does playing football on the different planets of the solar system really matter? I mean, the kids who like science are going to study science, and then they're going to go on to be scientists. And so if the school science system is set up as a gateway to a career in professional science, and these other kids are not getting a lifelong love and appreciation of this subject, does that really matter? Well. We could look at it this way. Right now, planet Earth has some stories of its own to tell. And we have no choice but to listen. And some of these narratives are pretty challenging. We've got feeding the population, generating enough energy, clean water, global climate change, control of disease. And how are we going to resolve these stories? Probably through science and technology. And who is going to do this? Well, the children of today who will be the adults of tomorrow. And don't we want everyone to contribute to the debate, not just a highly specialist few? Wouldn't it be better if everyone was scientifically literate? Don't you think if it was more of a general consensus about scientific literacy, we might make faster progress at solving some of the world's major problems. So how do we create this engagement? There's a Nuffield um, Foundation report into primary science education, and it raises this point that often school science starts by presenting children with a sort of miscellany of ideas, rather than beginning with an overarching question, such as, why do you look like your parents? Or what would happen to me if I fell in a black hole? Perhaps, it's just a suggestion. And the report goes on to say that school science tends to suffer from a failure to generate a sense of anticipation around an unfolding narrative, which brings me back to storytelling. What if you took a boy and called him George, and you took a girl and you called her Annie, and you took a black hole and you put them together and you saw what happened? 
It's the what if of creative invention on a literally astronomical scale with the proviso that I still can't break the laws of physics, however handy that would be for the plot mechanics. And it's not easy creating an earthbound, relatable storyline that describes the unimaginably big or the incredibly small. And generating a sense of narrative anticipation around, for example, the Big Bang, when it happened 13.78 billion years ago, was actually quite awkward um, in terms of generating a plot. But I had a lot of help from some really amazing scientists. Uh, one of my favourites is called Dr Stuart Rankin, and he's at Cambridge University. And he came up with the fiendishly clever invention, the inverse Schrodinger trap. It's a room, and when you're inside it, you don't know whether you will be dead or alive when you leave. <laughs> and I've been able to get out across, I've been able to get out and talk to kids about the stories and about the concepts that they describe. And I've been all over the world doing this, Japan, Australia, New Zealand, uh, Russia, Europe, North America. I've even been Ofsted inspected in the Cayman Islands. <laughs> um, and there are some moments that happen Wherever I am, there are some common denominators, some moments that happen everywhere. And one of them comes when I say the words, once upon a time. When I say those words, I feel the room relax. It's as though these words are a signifier to my young audience that they're in safe hands. That however far flung, however weird or counterintuitive the part of the universe we're visiting is, the shared experience of going there through storytelling will hold us together as we travel. The story will see us through. Or, as one young audience member once said to me, I only signed up for your talk to get out of French, but you were quite good. <laughs> <laughs> and I run question and answer sessions after my talks, and I, I had questions on everything, really. Aliens, the end of the universe, the edge of the universe, in a black hole, out of a black hole. Um, Recently, earlier this year, a literary festival asked me to speak to 300 primary school children and the venue they booked was a church, which meant that I fielded the question, did God create the universe or did it happen in the Big Bang while standing in front of a very large wooden cross? <laughs> I gave the answer the best way I knew how. But there's one question I'm asked all the time and I still don't have a good answer for it. The question is, what is it like to have Stephen Hawking as your father? <laughs> what is it like? Hmm. It's a very difficult question to answer. And as luck would have it, a film has now been made <coughs> called The Theory of Everything, a very beautiful, very moving film. And it's about my parents' lives. And I play a very small part in this film. And I went to a preview screening. Um, this is actually a photograph. This is a still from the movie. It's not a photograph from my childhood, although it could be. And when I was watching that film, it occurred to me that when I was that child, I never read a story about a child like me. I never read a story about a little girl who had a father in a wheelchair. And maybe if I had, maybe if I had read about someone in similar circumstances, it would have helped me to understand the complicated feelings I had about my family circumstances. But I didn't have that shared experience. I didn't have that identification through narrative that I believe can have such a positive impact on helping people process the events of their own lives. And it wasn't until I was much older that I first heard people tell stories which mirrored back to me my own experiences in ways I could relate to. And hearing these other stories, it kind of eased a burden of loneliness, of isolation, of this feeling that I'd lived this life where the events were so extraordinary or so exotic that they had no comparison in other lives. And so it came to me that 
the simple act of storytelling, of telling your story, or listening to a story told by somebody else, actually has the most dramatic, therapeutic, and redemptive value of all. And so, if we go back to the little boy at the birthday party, what would happen to me if I fell in a black hole? Well, the obvious answer is, I hope you don't. I hope that never happens to you. But if you do find yourself in a very dark place, don't despair, because there is a way out, and maybe a story will save you. <laughs>